Welcome everyone to our uh, October 22nd Patreon interview. With us today, we have Professor Vivica Villapillai and Roy Mullay to talk about, if I, I, I hope I'm saying what I need to say right, Shetland, is that how the language is referred to? That's uh, at, at Shetland. Uh, Shetland. Is, yeah, it's, uh, it's a kind of unique sound in, in Shetland that's... Uh, You'd, I, well, I'd, I'm not sure. Do you find it other places in 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 the UK? I'm I'm, I'm not all that sure. Which, which the, 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 a? the the AE uh, the spelling. Well, no, the the sound. The sound. Yes, you'll find that sound in in various mm -hmm. uh, lots of different kinds of varieties of both English and Scots. But in in any case, it's it's Shetland. Um, um, while we're at it here, there is a fellow Shetlander here. I can see Helen Balfour. Um, so we're actually three of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, very cool. Um, and you are talking to us from Shetland. Yes. Yes, okay. we're sitting in Shetland and uh, we can clear that up right away. You're in Shetland. You're not on Shetland. You live in <laughs> Shetland and we're sitting in Shetland, um, which is if I look out the window, and I look straight west, I'll end up um, and, you know, fly straight west, I'll end up in, on the southern tip of Greenland. Um, that's that's the height of where we're at, roughly. Uh, and yeah, it on the map, it's pretty much smack in the middle of the UK, Faroe and Norway, like a triangle. But culturally and historically, it uh, doesn't feel uh, very close to the UK because of the history of Shetland. So um, it rather feels like it belongs to a kind of a North Atlantic uh, uh, area, cultural area. And and I'd, I'd like to get back to that in just a moment. Would you also, uh, the, the two of you, give us a quick introduction uh, about yourselves, how what, what your backgrounds are and how you came to an interest in, in uh, well, this part of the world and its language? Well, I'm a linguist. I'm a typologist, come a contact linguist, come historical linguist. So I look at a typologist looks at patterns globally. What's where, why is kind of the core question. What kinds of patterns do we find? Uh, linguistic patterns, where do we find them and why do we find these kinds of patterns? Um, but I'm also a historical linguist that looks at how languages evolve over time and a contact linguist who looks at how uh, languages affect each other if they're in uh, sustainable contact, in a long-drawn contact, what that does to the languages, how they evolve, uh, and these kinds of things. And Shetland triangulates all these things for mm. me. So I, um, I've been looking at Shetland for, for the last number of years and came here because of that. And, and you've already, always been in Shetland. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I met Rebecca first uh, at a lecture she uh, was given at, uh, the, at the Shetland Museum about the, the work she'd been doing up until that point and it was absolutely fascinating and uh, a notepad went round at the end of the lecture uh, for names to for possible volunteers for future research and I put down my name and uh, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's where we are now. <laughs> Good job that you did because uh, any linguist working on uh, any language is uh, more than grateful for any help you can get, especially by native speakers. And so Roy has, uh, is, is very much uh, a, a co-investigator in this project, which is about documenting and describing Shetland, uh, looking at contemporary Shetland, comparing it with um, a slightly older version, pre-oil Shetland, because the idea is, the prevailing idea is that Shetland was uh, uh, adversely affected by the oil era, that the shift to English, which is ongoing, uh, was triggered by the oil era uh, when a lot of people moved in. The oil era, uh, when, we say, when we say the oil era, we mean uh, the era between, uh, say, the early 70s, 1970s, and the early 1980s, when we had a huge uh, influx of population because of the infrastructure that the oil industry then invested in and so on. And this is not just people working on the oil rigs or with oil specifically, the whole society had to expand because you had to cater for all these people. So mm -hmm. this means 
uh, expansion in terms of um, of bureaucracy too, as in there's a, a lot of office work, there's a lot of logistics, there's a, uh, expansion in the healthcare and the school system, the whole society expanded. So there was a, a lot of job opportunities here and, and that meant a lot of Shetlanders that there had been a, a steady brain drain because opportunities weren't available here for an educated Shetlander. The, now Shetlanders, educated Shetlanders could come back, Hi, uh, people that had university uh, education could come back, there were uh, plenty of opportunities. But others, non-Shetlanders, could also move to Shetland and, and did. So the the what we call the linguistic ecology, the language ecology, the linguistic environment was there's no way that was not affected by this mm. in, 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 uh, huge increase in population. But the question is whether that shift to English was triggered by it or not. We can't know unless we know what the pre-oil speech looked like. So until we've described that and are comparing it with the contemporary speech, only then can we say if the oil era actually triggered this or not. And so that's what this project does. It looks at historical recordings, oral history recordings. That's our pre-oil data. And, and it looks as, at contemporary Shetland. And at the same time, we are advocating for recognition of this language. So we do everything bilingually. Uh, to show that this is a language that functions on, on, on every level as just as well as any other language. Uh, our, our website is bilingual, our social media posts are bilingual, and, and if anyone has uh, explored our website or will explore it, you'll see that there is a, a varied amount of information there about the language, about the history of it. There's also all our posts, social media posts are collected there, so, you know, in, in a big uh, collection, our output and, and various other things, access to our Wordle, which came out in February and access to our um, um, interactive online dictionary where speakers can put in their own voices and we want, we're hoping for a lot of interaction there so that we get a more nuanced view of Shetland. We, we, we started out this dictionary with about 8,000 entries now we want speakers to lend their voices so that we can map um, Shetland. Thank you, Stella has, has already found our site and, and pasted it. Um, and we want people to add their own um, uh, lexical items or words and definitions and whatever, because you can never capture everything. And there's, uh, there's a lot of um, fine tuning that can be done and internet allows us to do that um, with, with online dictionaries now. So that's what we're hoping for with that engagement. All of that can be accessed uh, on our, on our uh, website. And the way we do it is we do everything by default in Shetland and then you have to choose English mm. if, you, if you don't want Shetland. So again, to show by action, uh, by action that it's as viable as any other language. It reminds me a little bit of early efforts to secure recognition for Norwegian as distinct from Danish. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you give us a little bit of a capsule history of language in, in Shetland? Uh, of language in Shetland, yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, um, Shetland is, predates English. So we have, at the moment, Shetland is a bilingual community. Um, and it's, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just take away the chat for a moment because it's distracting me. Uh, so we've got two languages here, main languages, Shetland and, and Standard English or Shetland Standard English. Um, and Shetland is older, English came later. So Shetland predates that. And as a, as a language, what we had here was, uh, we had uh, Norn, which was a Western Norse um, uh, descendant um, from, well, from 800 really and onwards, uh, and in a big way from 875 when, when it became part of the Norwegian kingdom, that stayed uh, dominant until really the 15th century when, when Scots, lowland Scots, started moving in on a bigger scale. At the same time, there was very, very intense uh, trade with the Hanseatic League. So the low Germanic languages were spoken here as, as well. People were multilingual. We've got a few testimonies that we have, all 
uh, speak about the multilingual nature of the islanders. And, and then Shetland became Scottish, Scottish owned. So with that, um, Scots became the administrative and therefore the kind of the social politically dominant language. But Norn stayed uh, as, as, as these things go, Norn, Norn stayed for a fair while. So we had a, a bilingual community for at least 250 years, which then also had this intense trade contact with low Germanic languages, uh, Dutch and low German. So that's, that's the ancestors of Shetland. Norn, Scots, with a lot of influence of the low Germanic languages. And English really only comes in a, in a more sustainable and more systematic way in the early 18th century. By, uh, by then, Scotland and England had unified. Uh, English had become a, a more dominant language, was promoted and all of that. And it, it was moving north and spreading uh, on the British Isles too. Um, by 1827, so early 19th century, there was a school in every parish in Shetland and the teaching language was English. So you see, the, the dominance of English is quite late, but mm -hmm. it's very profound and it's, it is very profound still. It's still the case that when people say to speak proper, which grates on any language, uh, that they mean English um, and anything else is, is not proper. So Shetland has been stigmatized for at least 200 years, at least since Pan teaching was, was in English. That's, that's sort of the history in a nutshell. And uh, what is the population of Shetland today? What, well, 22? 23, maybe 23,000? 23, 23,000, roughly, yeah. And of that population, how many would you say speak Shetland? Well, our estimates would be somewhere between 30 and 50% uh, of the population. This, the census estimate is much, much lower because Shetland is not included in the census uh, oh. as a language in its own right. Uh, so what you get, your options are English, Scots or Gaelic. Now, this part of, of Scotland has never been Gaelic. The last time it was Celtic was when the Picts were here. Um, and that's not Gaelic anyway. So, um, so Gaelic isn't relevant for, for uh, Shetland in a, in a major way. But Scots here to Shetlanders means lowland Scots, means mm -hmm. Edinburgh Scots, which is justified. That's fair enough uh, to identify Scots with the, the, the seat of Scotland. That's fine. But that's not what's spoken here. So Shetlanders won't tick Scots because it, they don't speak lowland Scots. They speak Shetland. And so you get an underrepresentation of the figures on the census because Shetland isn't included. As, and an overrepresentation of English because people end up taking only English because it's the only language they can identify with. Um, it should be said that ev any Shetland speaker like Roy here and, and Helen uh, uh, is also an English speaker. Every single Shetland speaker is a bilingual speaker. Not every Shetlander is a Shetland speaker. There are some that only speak English. And would you classify Shetland as Scots? Or would you consider it something? What I mean, I, Scots can be a pretty it, wide umbrella, and it can be kind of a narrower term. What? Yeah, it's one of these things where, as a linguist, you you really don't feel that it's all that relevant. I would, you could easily uh, uh, classify it as belonging to the Scots macro language, just like Yusk belongs to the Danish macro language, or. Uh, we've got all the various Norwegians and, and you know, but then we have the problematic Elf Dali and what do we do with that? Is it this, that or the other? It's, it's one of these uh, varieties that is so distinct that yes, it's got a lot of Scots, but it's got two ancestors with a lot of contact from uh, another, another uh, uh, area. So it is in by any kind of contact linguistic definition, it could easily have had a history of being a mixed language with a capital M and capital L, mm -hmm. like Michif, um, which means that classifying it as one or the other, you know, how would you classify Michif? Is it French or is it Cree? Well, it's both. Sure, sure. So, sure. Well, 
And I mean, you know, well, you, you, you had already, uh, graded on yourself by using the term proper. So I decided to grade further by using the term classify, but we, we actually just had a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago with, uh, professor Paul Roberge at the university of North Carolina about mixed languages. So this is something that, uh, uh, we we've talked about recently here too. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what traces of Norn do you see in modern Shetland? Uh, well, a lot more than has been assumed previously. What's been studied a lot is the sound system and the lexicon. Uh, there's a fair few studies uh, on Shetland, uh, uh, the accents of Shetland, and a fair few studies on the lexicon of Shetland. That's the, that's the most iconic. Uh, we've had that for the last hundred years, really. And there's a, a big dictionary by Jakob Jakobson that traces the Norn uh, elements in Shetland. It's, it's the biggest dictionary to date uh, of any kind of version of Shetland. But there's a lot more Scandinavian in Shetland than, than I was led to understand when I started, when I looked, when I studied the, the literature that was already available, uh, I wasn't, um, I wasn't being shown how much there actually is. So in, in a sense, we've been mapping that out. And it is, it's all over the, stru uh, the structural system. There's, uh, you see on our site, we have a, a kind of, a, we have categories for the post. And one of the categories is hidden in plain sight or in Shetland. Uh, for our very in. In front of our very eyes. Um, where we, we've, we've tagged any of those features that we've mentioned that have essentially been hiding in plain sight because the elements sound English, mm. but the grammar isn't. So one of the things that is very uh, stark here is that Shetland has a gender system, a grammatical gender still. Uh, you refer to things uh, as he, she or it, and, and that the only standard language left in, in the Germanic cluster that has that is German with the grammatical gender. The others have, um, have there are some that have two genders. So the standard Scandinavian languages and standard Dutch have two genders that is neuter and, and uh, common. But uh, Shetland has uh, three genders just like German and they, they don't follow any, there's no biological uh, uh, link to it, it's, it's other kind of criteria. Now, he, she, and it, they all sound English, but English doesn't have that system. So referring to the phone as a she, or, um, or the, the computer as a he, that is not English. So this is one of these things that's been hiding in plain, plain sight. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's because of the nature of the stigma of this language, Things have been eroding in the sense that anything that was um, deemed to be incorrect has constantly been uh, uh, under the power of correcting it according to the English system. Um, but it's not incorrect, it's simply Shetland grammar. Another thing that has constantly being corrected uh, that Shetlanders always have been told uh, to you know uh, stop doing is to have uh, expressed the perfect with a form of B. So you don't say I have had tea, you say I am had tea, hmm. right? Uh, or I am written or you are come or something. Now that's one of these things that you know, people in school and so on have been corrected for, but that's misguided. This is simply a different grammar, uh, but it can survive because it sounds like English. So there are a fair few of them. Uh, the, the prepositions, for instance, the use of prepositions is very Scandinavian. Um, you, you go till a place, you don't go to a place. Uh, there's a differentiation between the verbal particle to as in to do something mm. and uh, to go to a place. Oh, I okay. hmm. So a, a distinction between to the infinitive marker and till the preposition. Yeah. That's te, interesting. Te and till. So te, you can say to go to the post office. Uh, to getting till the post office, yeah. Hmm. Huh. And it's, well, that's, that is very interesting. And, and actually, I was just thinking about with the, with the gender system, you know, the three Scandinavian languages that are closest to Shetland 
Icelandic Faroese and Norwegian Nynorsk all have that three gender system still. Yeah, the, uh, ex ex exactly that. And and of course, there are, you always have to say the caveat that there are varieties in Scandinavia that still have it. Jysk still has it. The Eastern, North, Northeastern Swedish uh, uh, dialects, they still have it and so on. But the standard languages have done away with it. Uh, whereas, yeah, the Western Norse descendants still have it. Uh, other things that you then, you know, that get retained because they can hide in plain sight is things like referring to weathers, uh, weather conditions with he rather than it. Mm. You know, there's a dummy for all the Germanic languages, which is extremely rare in, 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 in typological terms and in, in global terms. Um, but it's even rarer to have an animate uh, dummy as in he for the mm. The Western Norse, uh, the descendants of Western Norse and Shetland, they all have that. Yeah, that is familiar from, from uh, Icelandic and some Norwegian. And mm -hmm. And I was thinking, um, you know, one thing that's really striking about this gender system too, I, I guess I'm getting hung up on this because it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to me, is that uh, the examples you used were very new vocabulary items, right? The yeah. phone being she, computer being he. So the system mm -hmm. is still productive. Exactly that, yeah. Uh, that's the point I keep making is that this is a totally robust system. New words get plugged into this system. Um, the, the, whether, whether, an item gets a he or a she, that's quite complicated, but whether it's animate or inanimate is quite straightforward. Um, concrete count nouns are he's or she's. Mm -hmm. And abstract uh, nouns or mass nouns, they are it's. So, oo, wool is it, or, or you know, idea is, is an it, but a laptop and a phone and... and a stove hmm. is often a she. The fiddle was always yes, a she always, too. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's interesting because that that shows reorganization from uh, the old Norse or, or old English situation where there's not that kind of semantic mapping. It's uh, uh, with, with, the, with the items that I could test uh, longitudinally, as in between the pre-oil uh, and the current uh, speech. Um, there was. A significant, statistically significant overlap with the Old Norse system, um, and not with the Old English. But of course, the Old English and Old Norse had a statistically significant overlap. And if they hadn't had that, I would have wanted to know why. So, the the two ancient languages they match fine, and that's how it should be because they are very close, and you know they're you know that's fine. But Shetland matched between the two of them. Shetland matched better with Old Norse than with um, Old English. And are there morphological differences between words of different genders? Not that I've well, apart no. Uh, from what I've seen, it's a semantic definition. Um, the morphology is there's not much morphology left in that sense. Uh, uh, so. It's not doesn't match the German system in that sense, you know, with the uh, um, with the morphophonemic uh, rules and uh, systems that you have there. Uh, the German system is very complicated, and we all of us have been trying to find <laughs> kind of a a good descriptive system for it we never quite succeed because there's so much at play and of course within German uh, it also differs Bavarian has a different system for you know rearranges things too so um, we end up all saying that right you simply have to learn it yeah. um, the there is a perceived dominance of m masculine gender as in that most things are he's but it didn't quite bear out with the data. And uh, there's also a perceived idea that uh, the, a certain area in the South has uh, calls everything she's. Uh, you know, people will say in Cunnings where everything is she. Again, that didn't quite bear out. There was a higher, a higher rate of them, but not as dominant as, as assumed. There were some areas where the pattern that you saw was that male speakers used more female genders and, and female speakers used more male genders. So male speakers used more she's to refer to things and female speakers used more he's to refer to things. 
um, but it does seem to boil down mostly to semantics. And there seems to be a kind of a, uh, there seems to be an emotive element to it too. Because yeah. one of the comments you would get was, well, if it's annoying, it's a he. <laughs> I see. Oh. Still, uh, I, I'm, I'm really surprised at how productive it is and that that would be, well, like I said, lying out there in plain sight. But spe speaking of in plain sight, I, I was noticing with when Roy was translating that into Shetland, I, I heard the plural "een" for eyes. Right, so that sounds to me fairly Scots, Scots-like. Uh, what is the? Can you characterize the morphology of Shetland more broadly? Is it is it Scots-like? Is it Norn-like? Is it something in between? What what can you tell us about how um, nouns and verbs work? It's. It's in between, but you know, the, all the descendants uh, of, of all these languages have kind of uh, shed a lot of their morphology. So it is Scots-like, um, but that doesn't make it all that different from the Scandinavian languages either, because the Scandinavian languages have, have lost a lot of, we have to remember that, um, um, Shetland was owned by first the Norwegian kingdom and then the Danish kingdom. So the input has been both Western and Eastern Norse descendants. Uh, it started with the Western Norse descendants, but then it was Eastern Norse descendants. So it's a, it's, it's, it muddies the waters. It's never uh, uh, very straightforward. So again, it's not really straightforward to classify the morphology one way or another, except that it's um, like the standard Scandinavian languages as opposed to the insular, so the continental Scandinavian languages as opposed to the insular Scandinavian languages, and like both English and Scots, a fair bit of the inflectional morphology has gone. Mm. Uh, when that happened is impossible to say because there's very little Norse left uh, in the data. Yeah, the the very little Norn that I've ever seen, which might be all the Norn that there is to see to some degree. Um, you know, like you, you there there's a, a Lord's Prayer preserved, I believe, from 1600s to 1700s, and uh, I think it, depending on exactly how what I see on the page would have been realized orally looks like something that could have even been mutually intelligible with Western Norwegian dialects, but uh, it's hard to know what the spoken situation was. It is still the case that a lot of people here feel uh, a huge sense of recognition with especially Western Norwegian dialects, but also a sta you know, Bukmål, standard uh, Norwegian and uh, even standard Swedish. Uh, Danish, not so much. It's uh, evolved so much uh, away from the others. But I have heard numbers, a number of stories where people have answered a question. A Shetlander has answered a question and not even realized that the question was posed in Norwegian. Hmm. Uh, and, and so, and a lot of uh, both Dutch and Scandinavian visitors to Shetland feel a sense of recognition when they come here in the prosody, in the melody of the language. Scandinavians would feel a lot of recognition in, in, the, in the lexicon too. So, so uh, you can say that, for instance, uh, do, you can say in Shetland during COVID, you shouldn't cough because you might infect someone. Or you would smut them, yeah. I mean, you shouldn't cough. <laughs> or host. Yeah. So, <laughs> Host and smitten, all of that sounds downright Scandinavian. Um, many times, especially when I was new here, people tried to trip me up using Shetland words. And of course, they were just entirely familiar to me as a Swede. I, I didn't even, you know, it's, it's even happened that we've realized that I've translated things without realizing that, that, that it was, you know, that it wasn't an English word because I, I had interference from my two mother tongues, which are Swedish and English. And I didn't even react to the fact that you know, owls, uh, uh, a boat then uh, is to bail out a boat and that is earth sign Swedish. So I wasn't, I was just putting, I just put owls. I didn't realize right. that, I didn't think about it. So there's a lot of common ground. And by the way, uh, other people attending, feel free to throw in your questions and, and remarks here. Don't let me hog this completely if you have questions you want to throw in. Um, so 
as far as the vocabulary, I mean, I, I can get annoyed with statistics like, you know, English is 60 or 65% romance language, because if you count all the words in the dictionary, that's how many words are from French or Latin. But do you have a rough sense of uh, what percentage of maybe everyday vocabulary is Scandinavian in origin? No, and, and the reason for that is that there's so much overlap between all these Germanic languages. So how do we know whether it is Scandinavian or Scots or, or Low Germanic? There's so much overlap. These are very closely related languages. That's where a, a mixed language like Michif becomes uh, nearly easier to analyze because Cree and French, the two input languages are so different. Sure. And so that you can identify the sources very easily. But here we've got a situation where Scots being one of the input languages is itself highly uh, influenced by Norse. Mm -hmm. And then we have Norse. And then we have the low Germanic languages who also influence the Scandinavian languages radically to the right. extent that, you know, 30%, uh, if you count, of the Swedish, uh, Danish and Norwegian lexicon is low Germanic because of the Hansa period. So, you know, it's, 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 no, we yes. can't really answer that question. <laughs> no, that's that's kind of a whirlpool. I, well, but but that's part of what's fascinating about it. Uh, exactly. So, Simon asks in the chat, "Do you have any thoughts on the Unst lay?" as is the case with any contact language, especially in, in, in uh, imbalanced contact situations, it is not the speakers that are writing these things down. They're written with the foreigner's ear. Right. And in this case, they're written with the ear of someone from mainland Britain, most commonly someone speaking English rather than Scots. So we've got all those filters too. And if through all those filters, this mixed nature comes across, then it probably was even stronger on the ground than it comes across in this written sources that have been edited and, and you know, been, you know, people are using an English spelling and all of these kinds of things that is the, the caveat of these, um, uh, these types of data. And uh, Elena asked, uh, pursuant to what you were saying a little bit before, do you think the similarity of all the input languages was uh, part of what allowed them to have so much impact on Shetland? Uh, um, might have been. Uh, there's a blessing and the curse of, of being similar, but not, this, uh, not uh, the same. Uh, in contemporary UK, uh, Gaelic and Welsh gets much more recognition than Scots mm -hmm. because they're identifiably different. And Scots is treated as, a, as bad English, but it never was a dialect of English any more than English was a dialect of Scots. So there can be, there can be two sides to that coin. Sure. And uh having had a, a little bit of participation in, in Scott's research and, and, and communities. Um, I, I know a little bit about what you mean by that curse. You show someone a text in Scott's and, and if their background is just in English, they can laugh at it. Right. Like, Oh, that's funny. Right. It's like, you've spelled out a funny accent. It's like, no, it's, okay. it's, <laughs> there's something actually systematically different here. Yes. Um, yes. And, that, and that can be harder to persuade people of when the languages are, are more. Yes, no, it's, it's very easy to see that Welsh is something entirely different because right. it's so very different. Um, so, so yeah, no, there are two sides to that. It can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse, um, these kinds of things. I see someone uh, saying that they argued that, someone had argued that this unslay was a, a hoax. Uh, well, no, the, the data that we have from his written data from, you know, pre-internet times, so uh, no, it's not. It's not from 2020. It's uh, it's about <laughs> it's about 250 years older than that. And, and by the way, uh, 
you know, when I, when I read about Norn, I, I see not just Shetland, but also Orkney come up. Is there a similar linguistic situation in today's Orkney or is Orkney pretty different from Shetland today? Uh, Orkney is the closest relative to Shetland and uh, would really be a sibling to Shetland. The, the situation in the, the Norn areas were Shetland, Orkney and Caithness. These are the ones that have uh, uh, influence from Norn. And Orkney is the one that is still the closest to Shetland. Um, but it's again, it's it's very very similar, and and you know between Shetlanders and or Orkneyans, you know that you can easily speak uh, uh, Shetland and Orkney, just like a Sweden and, and a Norwegian can speak to each other easily. Um, but it's not identical; it's not the same. Um, so someone would have to do the same kinds of studies so that we could parallel check for me to be able to answer exactly how similar or different they are, but. They are very, very similar, very close, certainly the closest relatives, but they're not identical. And, and the, that's because the, the history was not identical. Uh, the Hansa influence was much stronger in, in Shetland than in Orkney, for one. And uh, Orkney was always closer to the mainland. So uh, the Scots influence started earlier. Um, yeah. Speaking of, uh, you know, by the way, terms like mainland and Scots and Scotland, do do Shetlanders consider Shetland part of Scotland? I mean, not <laughs> politically, but like, are do do you consider yourself Scots? Like, I, I just just an idle question, maybe, but um, at, obviously, at, at, at this very between person to person, but I think I think it would be fair to say that Shetland speakers, in particular, have a very uh, unique identity separate from uh, the rest of Scotland and that folk feel that we have our own identity and culture and language that doesn't involve kilts, shortbread, haggis, mm -hmm. all the things that you associate with Scotland. We have our own versions of this and so um, it can grate a bit on people when we are kind of identified as Scots when that's not really necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, you will hear both in the oral history interviews and, you know, what I've uh, also heard a lot is people will clarify we're Shetlanders, we're not Scots. Um, but it's always in several layers. People are first and foremost Shetlanders and, and second Scots. Um, but you see, Shetland is essentially colonized twice, once by Edinburgh and once by London in that chronological order. And what you'll hear people say, kind of jokingly, but you know how these jokes are, there's a bit of uh, seriousness uh, uh, to it. Yeah, that's ha Helen saying, saying the same as Roy. It's a very, very common feeling, you know, Shetland are not Scottish. And, and what I can tell you that I've heard uh, a fair few times is the story where people will say, uh, look, in London, they don't like us, but in Edinburgh, they hate us. And <laughs> So there is a complicated layer of history, colonization, and all of that, how that feeds into the, um, to the sense of identity. Hmm. And, well, I was just wondering, because uh, in, in terms of trying to keep a language uh, alive and vibrant, passed down to new generations, of course, it helps to have allies. And I, I didn't know if there was a sense that you know, like the something like the Scotsling Soci or something like that would take an interest in Shetland and vice versa if there was like a sense of that being a common cause or two different causes? Well, yeah, again, it's a complicated issue. We would argue yeah. that uh, giving Shetland recognition actually furthers the pan Scots quest for recognition because to me it's to both of us, it seems that we've we've been engaging too much in this whole uh, pigeonholing and, and categorization, uh, rather than in the entire biocultural crisis that we're in at the moment, boils down to mono thinking, mono culture, mono agriculture, mono whatever. Uh, let's stop with that and let's look at regional strengths and let's build all of that into a mosaic of a common good, so that. You know, if, because if you feel seen and recognized in your own right, you will feel more inclined. So that will increase the cohesion. And, and we see as linguists areas that recognize 
diversity as an asset. They are more cohesive in terms of general identity. Areas that engage in, in artificial sameness, they get less cohesive because people feel uh, governed from above from what they ought to be and ought to sound like and so on. So um, to us, it seems like recognizing these these str regional strengths as assets and as in fact as an as a commodity just like any other natural asset will strengthen the cohesion just like if we have regional solutions for agriculture and energy we'll have a more secure and stable supply well the same goes for for languages if we recognize that diversity is an asset we'll have a stronger cohesive sense of common purpose um, so for us, there's no contradiction, you know, whether uh, Orkney wants to go ahead and do the same kinds of recognition, well, that's great. Why not? You know, we're all, we're all belonging to a family here, but let each sibling get its own name and identity, and then we can all build together towards that common uh, picture, this, this uh, a mosaic where each piece is essential to build a bigger picture. And speaking of that, that, that regional picture, what what are the domains in which uh, Shetland is being actively used now? Is it mostly a home language? Is it used in, in business in Shetland? Is there literature being produced in, in Shetland? There's a, there's a lot of poetry and has been for a long time and uh, a lot of children's books uh, in Shetland. Uh, what we are trying to uh, push for is that now we start with more technical writing as in just any kind of topic that is non-fictional. Um, we've been writing a lot about linguistics in Shetland so you know you can also write about geology or uh, biology well, well we'll be working on marine biology uh, together with uh, people here in Shetland and, and so on so there is literature uh, we've devised a systematic orthography that follows both uh, linguistic principles as well as the community intuition that you see in, in Digitalk, in, in the kind of uh, Shetland that you use in, in gadgets. This is another common phenomenon globally where marginalized languages that don't have a written system, they still get used very often in gadgets, in text messaging, mm in you know this kind of stuff uh, yeah, even even social media posts but the, the more intimate it is the more likely it is that you'll use it but it's a written form it's sort of using the spoken language but it happens to be a written form because it's the gadget so you text someone in in your in your language even though um it's not being being promoted uh, it's it's a safe area for marginalized languages to get used to get a, a use in in a written form and, th and therefore get speakers get their eyes used to seeing their language in a written form uh, because it's informal because what you often have in these kinds of uh, uneven situations with where, where one language is sti stigmatized and the other one is promoted is that you tend to get the stigmatized uh, variety used in informal situations but you will find Shet Shetland is, is used everywhere and you know you pay your bills in Shetland. You speak about your groceries in Shetland, and 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 you know you argue about uh, geopolitics in Shetland, and and so on. So there's no reason why that can't be put in on paper. It's simply that it's an attitudinal thing. It's simply not being considered good enough for it, and um, um, and then that vicious circle because it doesn't have a spelling system. It's therefore not good enough, and therefore it cannot have a spelling system, and so we, mm. so it goes on. And, and uh, so we're trying to to to, to counteract that. Mm -hmm. and, and on that note, uh, we can uh, announce that with our conversations with the University of the Highlands and Islands and the Shetland chapter of that, we have now got a Shetland language policy at the UHI Shetland, where for the first time uh, uh, an actual official body has de facto recognized the language as a language in its own right, and will start to promote it, produce materials, uh, teaching materials in it, and, and uh, uh, lobby for Shetland to be on the census, uh, lobby for Shetland to go into schools and get it uh, onto signage, uh, and so on. Hmm. And are, are there actual, uh, are there classroom classes in Shetland for 
Uh, no, Martin, no, no. I mean, it's my time as a student in Shetland. I believe I maybe had, well, certainly one, perhaps two lessons about Shetland. Um, none of them were in Shetland. Um, hmm. And so it's, it's really the, the lessons that we did get were really only served to quirkify the language and kind of not treat it as a normal everyday thing as a language of instruction as it, as it really should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even teachers who themselves might speak Shetland wouldn't use it in the classroom? They it did. Varies. Yeah, they didn't use it. It was very, very strict at one point uh, that you were not absolutely not allowed to use it in schools. Uh, that is is not no longer as strict. So we we you will have teachers that might. Uh, and in fact, I have I know teachers who once they see the proof that I show that Shetland is actually a language in its own right. They simply switch. They stop using English and start speaking Shetland. And I got messages back saying it felt so liberating to not have to translate in my head. So you know the capacity is there and the will needs to be there. It's a matter of that threshold because for for two hundred years, pretty exactly, people have been told it's no, it's not good, it's wrong, right. not just working but wrong. And there's been all this, like uh, Roy said, all this. Um, quirkifying of the language it's it's you use it for, just like we see globally for stigmatized language you use it in cartoons uh, you use it for you know niche things like poetry children's books but it's not treated as uh, good enough for um, say discussing when you know putting out a notice when the bins will be collected you know, or when the pharmacies will be open or whatever, you know, just ordinary everyday stuff that, you know, that you would use Shetland in the spoken medium to communicate these pieces of information for, but you wouldn't use it in, in the written medium because you've, you've never been taught to do it. And on that vein, I should also say, people have been trained to read and write in, in English for nine years at least. So everyone is very, very used to reading and writing in English, but no one has got that no one has been allowed or been given that privilege for their mother tongue and you know none of us are born uh, literate we all have to learn to read and write in our own languages um, but speakers of these kinds of, of languages stigmatized languages they don't get that um, taught to them mm -hmm. so it comes more naturally for Shetlanders to put things down in writing in English because that's what you've been taught to do now we have to learn, everyone has to start from scratch and learn that you can do this in Shetland too, just like you can do it in Swedish or uh, Italian or whatever. Right. And again, I'm seeing parallels with, with uh, parts of the history of Norwegian in the past 150 years. Uh, and very, very close parallels with Faroese, which was sure. also on its way out. And where you had pretty much exactly the, the same arguments as here, it's, 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 it's slang, it's bumpkin-esque, it's quirky and whatever. If you want to get ahead in life, you, you should learn Danish and you should go to Copenhagen and do your degree. And, and Jakob Jakobsen was then lobbying against that and, and you know, was laughed at. And everyone was complaining about how you can't have a spelling system because there's so much regional variation in the archipelago and so on and so forth. You could just copy and paste all those arguments and put them in Shetland, it's exactly the same. The difference being that in Pharaoh, three generations later, we have a linguistically confident community, which therefore also becomes a performative uh, uh, community in terms of education, strong education results, strong uh, stable economy, uh, a real can-do mentality. You have a brain gain. People are choosing to study in Torshaven rather than Copenhagen and so on. So it's possible to turn, but the time is now. We can't wait for too long because then we lose, we miss the bus. Sure. And that's an excellent parallel because, I, uh, I mean, the, the, the geographical isolation is similar as is the population, right? So it shows that even with a fairly small uh, population base, you can create that kind of confident. The, the, the Shetland and Fair are very, very similar in terms of environment. But the population was at one time nearly exactly the same. Now, Faroe is twice as 
as big in terms of population mm. than Shetland. And that's part of this brain gain. And we see again and again how linguistically confident communities become strong performative communities. You get it's it's a matter of do you want a brain drain or a brain gain? Um, that's what it boils down to. I, I, I see what you mean. And I think that can be true of some communities, even independent of, of uh, language matters. I mean, I see I see that in, in, again, like isolated parts of the American West, communities that have something the community sort of feels proud of and, and unites around typically uh, grow while other ones around them may wither away. Mm-hmm. We, so, by the way, we've taken about an hour of your time. I don't want to overtax uh, your time. Uh, I don't know how much time you, you, you've got, but if anyone does have further questions, please ask them. I'd, I'd also like to hear uh, if, if we could get like a sample. Of, uh, we were very expecting that. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, Helen has been saying here that uh, when, when, when you speak English uh, in, uh, in Shetland, especially, well, Helen, uh, there is an element, there's a slight ne- negative element in, in the knapping, but what you do is you knap, that is to speak English, and the K is pronounced. So it's a knapping, and anyone who tries tries to say napping will just be laughed at. I've, I've seen it happen. It's just, just don't even go there. <laughs> so, so, so are y'all knop. are y'all knapping me right now? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so is so uh, in 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 Germanic words with a K N that's still pronounced. So like, what is what is no? Like I know. No, no, it's not. Not all KNs are pronounced, but Knappen is. Okay. Uh, well, I, to know would be to Kane. That's yeah, anyway. That's, yeah. Oh, okay. that's, that's, oh, but so I, it's, yeah, from Kenna. Well, no, uh, there, there that, are Kneefs actually. The, the, yeah, that, that does vary from place yeah. to place. You will find a lot of um, small communities in Shetland that the, will that retains the the KN. So I, I mean, I live a couple of miles away from a a, a small township where. Yes, all the all the case were pronounced. It was yeah. a knee and a knot and a knife. Yeah, that's true. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that that's quite varied. Yeah, and uh, uh, but yeah, no is anyway English, so therefore the K won't be pronounced. Uh, what you say is Ken, so that's sure, the, sure. You know, yeah. I didn't I didn't um, think about that, but but that's that's a really cool retention of an old phonological yeah. feature, and of, and of course yeah. shared with Scandinavian. Yeah, and, of and course, there's also uh, front rounded vowels, so U and U are still here. That's awesome. So uh, do those show up in the places you would expect uh, an eye mutation, like uh, words like sister or? Uh, sister. Uh, sister, is a sister. sister yeah. But you have it in, you, you, you certainly have it in, uh, in non-derived lexica, like bird and crew. Uh, then you have uh, shun. Yeah, shoes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, a boon, which yeah, is not norm. So yeah. hmm. that's um, that's very cool, and and of course uh, also the the verb to know uh, being from from Kenna rather than know. I mean, K N O W, the English word is is very rare uh, in other Germanic languages. It's it's always been kind of weird to me how that won out in English. Yeah, I uh, I didn't know that knutting was actually uh, to knap uh, the equivalent of to knap. So that's that's uh, that's a great uh, um, nugget there, <laughs> because it is very similar in many ways. The whole attitudinal bit, you know, it's, it, there's an element of putting it on too when you knap, uh, oh. you know. <laughs> well, and I mean on a on a much uh much reduced level i mean if i try to talk to someone maybe who doesn't isn't as familiar with with some regional american speech and i I try to kind of go more toward a standard than i am i can feel kind of artificial and like kind of like i'm playing a part right yeah huh well yeah no we all do that that's of course uh, you know we all have various registers that we toggle between depending on the situation and who you're speaking to and, and you know in most cases it's an act of politeness uh, so that in, in Shetland for instance what you get is uh, you know which is infuriating to the linguist but everyone will politely speak English to you 
because it's simply an act, you know, it's how you do it. It's the bilingual society. It's it's just automatic. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I, um, I do have a, I could read a short um, excerpt for one of my grandfather's poems. Um, okay. if, you, if you'd be interested, it's called Croknawater. Croknawater uh, is a loch, uh, a small lake, um, just, I'm not sure, maybe half a mile above our house. Uh, and uh, it's somewhere where he liked to, to go up to and spend time. So I'll, I'll, I'll just read a short section out of this. I'll not read the whole thing because it will be far too long, but I'll, I'll read a few stanzas anyway. Right. Up over the hill, a hunt where hoose, I sometimes tack a dander. That helps to keep the old joints loose. Besides, huts fine to wander. Especially on a fresh boar day when winter time is by. The time has come for birds to lay and the leatherick sings sea high. I canna clum the hill as fast as what I used to do, for, thinking our years lying past, I shun wan till the crew. But now it takes a longer time to win there they were grinned. That's something o' a pantomime till I get me second wind. But still I get there and end, for there it's no sea steep, as slowly up the hill I wind, we name to sea but sheep. Then when I wreck the final rise and crook no lies below, there I can rest and fish me eyes and think a long ago. That's your grandfather? That's very... That's, yeah. That's, that's great. What? But you were tapping because his granddad in shit. My granddad, <laughs> excuse me, yes. <laughs> well, granddad, yes. Uh, he's, uh, he's still to the fore. He's 89. Um, oh, and a, bit of a poor old body, but uh, no, I, I, he's uh, a very accomplished poet. And he, uh, he never gave himself quite enough credit for the things he wrote. He does have one published book called uh, Wilkes, excuse me, Wilkes, Wind and Weevils. Um, he published in the early 2000s. So that's that's one of the poems from, from that book. And what's his name? Jack Avertson. Avertson? Edwardson. <laughs> oh, Edwardson. Okay. And, and, and by the way, one thing that I thought I noticed in there uh, that reminded me of Fairweeze was it sounded like some interdental fricatives or go, when, go to H, like in Faroese. Uh, the, the incidental fricatives are not really used that much here. So it's not uh, this or, or that or a thing, it's this and that and thing. Uh, but uh, things like, so intervocalic uh, dentals can get uh, fricativized or daughter, you know, uh, it can get kind of softened. Um, that's just rem re reminds me of fairways a little bit. Yeah, it, it, there'll be an element of that. Uh, it's very, very common for um, many of the descendants of, of the various old Englishes that we have to done away with the interdental fricatives. They're very rare in, in the, on the globe. So to say this, that, and thing, and so on is, is, is much more common globally than than to say this and that and, and thing. True, true. Um, but uh, I expect that you recognize vor and uh, and rec, so uh, to reach. And what else do we have? Crow. Well, crow, yeah. Crow is a very sheepy thing. I don't know if, if <laughs> well versed in it to be in sheep <laughs> matters. Uh, what is, what grind, is crow? Of course, grind, grind is, a, is a gate. Sure. Uh, yeah. And a gate is a path, so that's false friends. Um, yeah. There's a fair few false friends. Uh, we have them too in our posts, and they're also kind of collected uh, in, in categories. Anyone who wants to explore that can. I should say that anyone who wants to explore our site, you'll also find uh, a free available primer. We put it out in, in May, but we keep updating it. And you can download that as a PDF where you get all these, uh, whatever we've been uh, discussing. So that's there and that's bilingual. Um, you can get it more in a more collected way. The primary is aimed for at non-linguists. So you, you don't need to uh, be a linguist to understand it, but it's also done with the linguist in mind. So if you're a typologist and you want to look up certain things, uh, thank you, Stella. Uh, you you can you can use it 
as a linguist too. So there's a glossary for some of the inevitable terms. So just go ahead and feel free to use it. We keep updating it. So, you know, it, it keeps changing uh, as we post things and as we update stuff and so on. That's an Find awesome titles, resource. Things like that. <laughs> so by the way, should I read through the, the primer and, 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 and expose myself to Shetland and come to Shetland one day? Does it sound strange? Is it something that would be you know, maybe disliked for someone from outside to to attempt to speak Shetland. This, this is a this yeah. is a difficult uh, this is a difficult one. And uh, again, <laughs> the very typical situation that you get in communities where you've had strong stigmatization, where uh, especially if the descendants of the colonizer try to speak it, that's not liked. So, if uh, especially an English person in all innocence and all uh, honesty and earnestness tries to speak Shetland, it'll be grating to people to hear that broken Shetland because we will all have, we'll all have inter language stages. You know, we start out being beginners and we're not, you know, we can't get to be fluent until we practice. But if say a Syrian refugee uh, tries to speak Shetland, that's, uh, that's endearing. That's very okay, nice. Sure. That's an effort to integrate and so on. So this is exactly the same in Hawaii. It's exactly the same in Cape Verde, you know, in all these places where you've seen this quite aggressive stigmatization, you will get this difficult relationship with uh, interlanguage, so intermediate stages, um, accents, especially if the learner can be thought of as belonging to the former colonizer group. Sure, um, sure. But again, that's something that needs to change. Uh, and that's part of what we're wanting with this language plan. We, you know, we want to produce second language learning material too. There's a lot of interest to learn Shetland. Uh, and um, why not? It's an interesting language, it's a good language. So we're working on it. And I think uh, eventually people will, you see, if you can accept that your language is a language is an, in its own right, then it won't be threatening to hear intermediate accents, learners. Yeah. It'll just be, you know, people that are learning it. Right. Well, and I really appreciate all of the efforts that you've put into this. I mean, you've, you've made some incredible resources. And uh, as someone very interested in the history of the Scandinavian languages, of course, uh, I take this as... A, a mixed language with a lot of Scandinavian input. I mean, that's extremely, yeah. extremely relevant to my interests. Uh, yeah, and it's I, been so hard to find good resources about it for a long time. I would, as a, as a typologist, historical linguist, uh, contact linguist, I would really lean towards saying that if not still, at least at one time, it was a mixed language with a capital M and capital L, like Mikchif and Media Lengua and uh, Wutun and all of the other mixed languages we have. Um, but it's been under constant pressure from English. So, you know, it's, it's not the same now as it was uh, in, in 1750, that's clear, but no language is. So, you know, we need not worry about that. But it's still very unique and, and uh, um, very distinct and certainly more different to, um, to English, but also to the other low, uh, Scots varieties than standard Swedish and Bukmola to each other. So um, um, it's, it's, it's on, for a linguist on the, on the intelligibility scale and on the identity scale and all of that, it, it definitely is a language variety in its own right. right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us about it today. Um, and, and thanks by the way, for sharing that poem or the, the part of the poem by your grandfather. I'm, I, I hope oh, to, wow. is that, is that in the book? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. That is, that is in Jackie Edwardson's book that was published in yes. 2000. The early 2000s. Early I can't remind exactly what year, but yeah. All right. I need to try to track that down. Uh, does that sounds like a, just a, something I'd, I'd enjoy reading. Um, are, yeah. it's, is it, is anyone... it uh, available in print still? Um, you can, I'm not sure if the. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll inquire. Check, but... we'll, we'll check. Um... But I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure there's spare copies lying around somewhere. I'm sure we can get you a copy one way or another. 
Okay, I'd love to read it. <laughs> um, there, there may be copies on eBay or something for all I know. I've, I found weird things here and there. Uh, heck, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way. <laughs> you know, the, the, the first, uh, my first exposure to old English, which started me down a certain path, uh, was just finding it in a pile at a, at a used bookstore in Denver. Um, is it, any last minute questions, remarks from anybody? Well, thank you so much for answering our questions here today and for a really enlightening discussion. And thanks for all these resources, which, um, when I post this publicly, I'll also put the web addresses and such there for people to see. Please do, um, yes, and, and, uh, and uh, please feel free to use the resources. Uh, there are also, I can give you a link to a separate page um, where there's a little bit of overlap, um, or rather, th this is the page, but it's the, on YouTube, it's just Uradale. Uh Both I Hear the and Uradale, you'll find films for you in YouTube. Oh, uh, the I hear the films are bilingual. They are um, uh, it's it's subtitled because they're, they're not they're not spoken films at all. They're nature films, but it's all about language and place, one way or another. And on I on the I hear the YouTube uh, site, it's all bilingual. But uh, there's overlap with Oradale. These are both films of mine, and we've we've been doing them together. The the subtitling, the the ones that you find on Oradale uh, in the YouTube um Uradale section there are a fair few english uh, language films that are also about language and place so um, the overlap is where the bilingual films start then they are also and i hear it so anyone is free to use them um they they have been used as they are they are used uh, all over the world actually for teaching so do feel free to use them for teaching if you do it would be fun if you told me just so that i, I know if it's useful but um it's one way or another all related to language and place and they are max i think the longest is about 14 or 15 minutes so they're shorter films they're all you know low tech low key kind of things and, That's cool. uh, <laughs> i'll check that out i mean it's it seems like a fascinating place to learn more about too, aside from the language. It's a fantastic place. It's a beautiful place. It's definitely worth a visit. Uh, Absolutely. Everyone should come and have a look at Chapman. Uh, choose not to come in the, well, first of all, don't come in a pandemic. And secondly, uh, uh, the summer half of the year is, is nicer because it's lighter. Okay. Well, I hope I do make it out there one day. Well, thank you again so much for your time and uh, from everyone here, uh, I will wish you and all the thank best. Thank you, Simon, for the solidarity. I think uh, I think we can only be stronger and better together. <laughs> thank you again. All the best, everybody. <laughs>